further ado, we would like to move on to our featured uh, guest tonight. Um, as we had a chance to introduce earlier, Mr. Ishimaru is coming from uh, Washington, D.C. to be with us tonight. He is the uh, commissioner of the U.S. Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and has also been appointed to serve as its acting chairman uh, earlier in the year by uh, President Barack Obama uh, in January 2009. From his days as a research assistant on the U.S. Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians to his current work as Commissioner at EEOC, uh, Mr. Ishimaru has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to protecting the civil rights of all Americans. Uh, prior to his service on the Commission, Mr. Ishimaru served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice, where he supervised high-profile litigation uh, for the department. He also served as an assistant counsel to the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Civil and Constitutional Rights Assistant and to the director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and a research assistant for the U.S. Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, which uh, investigated the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, but also, he was one of this year's recipients of the Japanese American of the Biennium Awards. Uh, every other year, the JACL selects up to three individuals to receive as prestigious Japanese American of the Biennium Award in fields such as business industry, public affairs, law, education, medicine or science, and arts literature. So we are glad that you could be here with uh, us tonight and uh, look forward to hearing uh, your words tonight. <laughs> And thank you very much. Um, hopefully this stands. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I tend to come to Minnesota in November. Uh, the first time I came back, I was working on the Mondale campaign in 1984. And we came back for what we hoped would be the victory party, but it was the end of campaign party. And I remember going to downtown St. Paul, and uh, it was really cold. <laughs> uh, having been on the road for a number of months as we tried to get Walter Mondale into the White House, uh, you know, I had a little suitcase of stuff and uh, wasn't quite ready for the cold of November in the Twin Cities. And uh, I came in this afternoon from Chicago, where I'd been for the last couple of days, and found the warmth uh, reinvigorating. <laughs> an unusually nice November day I wasn't quite expecting. So it, it's really a treat to be, be back. I've been in Minnesota a number of times over the years, and uh, uh, it's, it's a lovely place. And, uh, I'm honored to join you this evening. And I, one of the beauties of being able to come and to speak to folks at events like this is that you, know, you run into people who know your family. <laughs> and, you know, Jim and Mickey Curiara came up to me and told me stories about my family. They knew my grandparents back in Oakland. And they knew my father, my aunt. And, uh, they didn't tell me any crazy stories, although I'm sure they have them. The <laughs> but uh, it, it's, that's, that's the beauty, I think, certainly for me, of being able to come and meet people and make connections. So, times long ago, and talks about our heritage, our shared heritage, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that tonight, um, because I'm, I'm going to sort of poach from the Day of Remembrance theme coming up of, of looking back and forward, um, because I think it really ties it in for a lot of us, especially, you know, here we are in 2010, and we live modern lives. And you know, most of us have done pretty well. We live pretty comfortably. But it hasn't always been like this. And for for the older generation of the room, you, you've gone through a lot over the years. And, uh, and I know certainly for the Issei forebears before that, it was quite a struggle. Normally, I don't read speeches. And I, I, I jot random notes down on pieces of paper, which I've done tonight. But I actually was reading a book on the plane the other day by Malcolm Gladwell, who used to write for the Washington Post. And they, I think he writes for the New Yorker now, right? 
and he, he writes these, these books, and this is from a book that came out a couple of years, years ago called Outliers, The Story of Success. I don't know if you've read it or not, but certainly it, it grabbed my attention as I was reading this on the plane because it was you know, one of the light reading, but it also sort of captured a lot of things for me. And he, he was talking about legacy. He's talking about cultural legacy. So let, let me just read this passage because it sort of sets the tone of what I want to talk about. He said, cultural legacies are powerful forces. They have deep roots and long lives. They persist generation after generation, virtually intact, even as the economic and social and demographic conditions that spawned them have vanished, and they play such a role in directing attitudes and behaviors that we cannot make sense of our own world without them. He goes on to say that success arises out of the steady accumulation of advantages, when and where you are from, what your parents did for a living, what were the, their circumstances of your upbringing. Now, you know, so Gladwell goes on to talk in his books about you know, how a lot of this doesn't come by accident, how a lot of this comes by hard work. And this pulled, pulled me back to the Japanese American experience and the Asian American experience, and for me, uh, you know, I thought a lot about this over the course of the last year. I was privileged earlier this year to go back to Japan with, with the Japanese American leadership delegation. And uh, it, it was an interesting trip because it was a bunch of people, a ton of us, now in sort of senior levels of various professions with business folks or some government folks. Uh, some, some public sector folks, um, and we went to Japan, we had never met each other before, we went to Japan for a visit, to go meet with Japanese leaders and to you know, try to extend the Japanese-American relationship and Japanese-American ties. And it got me to thinking about, you know, if I still lived in Japan, would I be where I was? Would I be in these hoity-toity meetings? You know, would I be doing this kind of stuff? And I think, frankly, the answer is no. You know, um, I, I would be probably doing what my people did, whatever it was. I remember once my father, on a trip to Japan, um, ran into someone that was a bellman at the hotel. And in Shikoku, where my father's family was from. And on his name tag, he said Ishimoto. You know? So I figured that if I was still there, I'd probably be hauling luggage too and be, be in a very different type of life than I, than I have now. And it brought me back to thinking of I wonder, now that I've reached a certain age, and I guess really at the age older than my grandparents were during the time of the war. Of, you know, what would I have done? Would I have left my home? And would I now leave my comfortable life here in this country to go off to something new? What would cause you to do that? Um, you know, and as I was in Japan, we, we gave presentations about us and, you know, how we got to where we were and what we did. <coughs> I often thought back to, I wonder what the story really was, because we didn't really talk about it. I'm not quite sure why my grandparents came over. Um, it just never came up in the conversation, and that's why I, I'm delighted that there's been an oral history project here. I'm glad we're gonna see later tonight clips of that, right? Um, because that captures so much of our experience in this country. Um, I, I think going back to my grandparents, and for many of us in this room, thinking back to your forebears, why did they come here? And my guess is, for most of us, 
it was for economic opportunity. That this this really was a way out of a road that probably would not change. And just as other immigrants to this country, people came here to seek their fortune, to do well. Um, our trip took different turns. And you know, that was a shared experience for m most in the community during the war. But I wonder, as I thought about this, I wonder, would I do that today if I had that sort of opportunity? Would I, in fact, root up, go off to a new and hostile land? You really didn't speak the language, didn't know the customs, totally foreign to you, especially in this age where everything is global, everything is interconnected. You can go to the airport right here, right? and fly off to virtually anywhere in the world and be there without stopping for the beauties of living in the Twin Cities, I guess. But you could be there, and you could be there very quickly. And I wonder whether I would do it. I wonder whether we would do that today. And for the young people in this room, and for our kids, you know, I wonder whether that's what, what the future holds for their future in this global and interconnected society. But the road was twisted for the Japanese American community. And as, as we all know the story of camp and the internment, the incarceration by our government and our people during the war. Again, for the young people in this room, um, you know, this is a story that needs to be told. I think in the last generation or so, the story has been told more. I know when I was growing up, certainly the story was my parents were in camp. My father was in high school at the time. My mother was a bit younger. She was in junior high school. But in our house, when people talked about going to camp, you know, when I was young, I thought that it really was a camp. And that it was fun. My father made a plate, I remember, the wood shop, right, that sat on the top of our refrigerator. And for the longest time, I thought, you know, they were off at camp. And they talked about it matter-of-factly, without rancor or, or remorse. Um, and it wasn't until later that I figured out that this wasn't normal. This was not part of the everyday course of business, that something had happened, and it was not something that was 